Hi, my name is David Sellers. I'm with Facility Dynamics Engineering. This little video clip is part of a blog post um, that lets you practice making a system diagram. It was developed originally to support uh, the year-long uh, retro commissioning class that we do at the Pacific Energy Center, but the reality is if uh, you're interested in trying your hand at a system diagram exercise, you could use this and not be attending the class. Um, Basically what I do is I have a virtual chilled water plant uh, that I created in SketchUp and we use that model uh, as the basis for the system diagram. Um, the resources to support your doing this, I did a whole string of blog posts about system diagrams. It's a technique I was taught almost virtually the first day I started work back in 1976, and I've used it ever since then, both as a designer and as a commissioning provider. It's really a great way to understand the system, to use the system perspective, um, which is critical uh, to design and, and operations and commissioning. Um, and you can uh, find those blog posts by going to the aviator.dos.wordpress.com website and then just using the drop down menu for categories to pick the system diagram category and all the posts in that string will be you know brought to the, the opening page and then you can click on whichever one you want um, in addition the uh, slides from the class we do at the energy center on system diagrams are available as a link off the blog if you just page down a little bit on the right side there's a topic 03 materials from classes and presentations and if you look there there'll be a link to the Pacific Energy class materials that'll jump you to uh, the public's part of my uh, Google Documents or Google Drive and you just navigate to the folder of interest there's a bunch of different classes there um, and you know bring back whatever slides you want uh, finally this presentation is actually you know part of the resources um, and this video clip is embedded in it if I get this to work the way I think it'll work. And it includes links uh, to screenshots of the plant and includes a link to the SketchUp model if you actually would rather do that. It's not copyrighted or anything. You're welcome to it. You know, use it at your own risk, etc. all that stuff. But um, it, it should give you sort of as close an experience as you can get to being in an actual plant and tracing this stuff out and, and understanding it. Um, the answer will show up in the next blog post. It'll have the same title, but with the words, the answer, tagged onto the end. So um, it'll be another video clip where I not only uh, show you the answer, but show you why it's the right answer and show you a, a potential wrong answer. Um, and then walk you through how a variable flow chilled water plant works. Um, and it'll turn out that one of the details of the system diagram is extremely critical in the context of realizing the design intent. And we'll just sort of look at all that when we get to the answer section. So the goal, generally speaking, uh, for the little project, if you want to try it, is to take a tour of the plant with me for the next 10 or 15 minutes. I'm going to just sort of walk you around in the model and sort of show you how there are some clues there, uh, not only about, you know, how the water's flowing and stuff like that, but what the design intent was behind the plant. So we'll be looking at things and sort of looking at how, you know, kind of without knowing a lot about the plant, you can sort of use your head and common sense and logic to sort of figure out what might have been in the designer's mind when they were putting this plant together. Um, and then, uh, th this plant's just the central plant. I don't have the model built out to the loads, but if you just assume the loads are piped across the mains leaving the plant and they're two-way valves, generally speaking, you'll get the idea if you want to draw them in your sketch. And then basically, you know, that'll be the end of this presentation and, uh, you know, the blog post will link you up to the stuff you need if you want to try the exercise. And the idea is for you to go ahead and develop a system diagram of the chilled water side of the plant you know, based on the model. And then looking at that, try to understand if you think the way it's actually piped captures the design intent that you interpret from looking at the plant with me in the next next 10 or 15 minutes. Um, this plant isn't any, per, any plant in particular, but it's very typical of a lot of the variable flow chilled water plants I've been around. Um, 
obviously the model is still in stages of development. For instance, there's no condenser water system there, and if you go in the switchgear room, there's no switchgear there, and the pipe's not insulated, and there's no pipe hangers and stuff like that. But there's actually enough information here for you to draw a system diagram, and in fact, it's a little easier because there is an insulation there and 20 other systems overlaid on top of it. So I'm going to just go ahead and uh, launch my SketchUp model. And uh, we'll start taking a look around. And again, uh, you'll be able to you know, grab this model off of the uh, blog post if you want to work in it instead of using the screenshots I'll provide. But for starters, I thought we just would you know, look at the, the pumps a little bit and, and, and think about a few things there. Uh, one thing, like if you're fairly new to... Uh, to, to this industry, you may not be that familiar with pumps. You know, these, these red things are pumps. Um, this is called a suction diffuser. And, you know, if I said, you know, tell me which way the water's going, you know, there's a number of ways you could do that. For instance, um, if you were to, oops, there we go. If you were to sort of walk around the plant a little bit and uh, walk up to the pumps and look at the valve on the discharge of the pump, let me just get it rotated a little bit more. You'd notice, well, gosh, you know, that valve has an arrow on it, probably the direction of flow. And that isn't a bad way to do that. The problem is that in more than one occasion, I've actually seen, you know, check valves, which is what that is. Actually, it's a triple duty valve. There's a check valve built into it along with a throttling valve and a service valve, which we'll talk about briefly here in a minute. Bottom line is I've seen them put in backwards. <clears throat> so it's a good indicator, but it's not as absolute an indicator as what I'm about to show you. Um, another trick to figuring out which way the water's going when you're out in a plant um, is to just sort of ask yourself, well, how does a pump work? This, these are centrifugal pumps. And, you know, centrifugal pumps are just a disc uh, that you know, with some veins on it that fling the water. And so the water has to flow into the center of the disc and gets flung out to the sides. I, I kind of th think about it like the merry-go-round I take the grandkids to. You know, you spin them and they get flung out to the side and, you know, they giggle and stuff like that. And the water probably doesn't giggle, but maybe gurgles. Um, but if you think about, you know, if there's a disc spinning inside this part of the pump and it, it's flinging the water to the perimeter, well, the water probably just about has to come in this way and then go out this pipe here since this pipe's attached to the perimeter of the housing where the disc would be. So that's a, another way to figure out which way the water's going and, and what I like about that personally is it's based on the physics of how a pump runs. Um, and in fact even if you spin a centrifugal impeller backwards it still flows water in the same direction it's just not very efficient at it um, because again it's just a disc flinging water. Um, you know, coming back to these pumps for a minute, and I have to be careful when I'm walking around like this because I can actually have superhuman powers. I can actually walk through concrete walls when you're in the SketchUp model. But what I wanted to do is focus on these triple duty valves for a minute and, and zoom in a little bit because as often is the case, if you are walking around a plant and sort of take a look at things, you'll discover some clues to uh, some opportunities maybe right there in front of your eyes. Uh, specifically, if you look at this triple duty valve, um, this is the calibrated scale that tells you how far open it is. And for this particular manufacturer, you read, you know, where the parting surface is against the scale. You know, and if, you, <clears throat> you know, there's perspective, you know, so if you move your head around, how you'd read that. Oops, <laughs> got a little close there. <clears throat> Excuse me get back out here. Anyways, the point was, you know, parallax comes into play, so, you know, if you aren't looking directly at this, you could, you know, see the in indication maybe as being, you know, 40 percent, or, you know, sorry, maybe 43 percent if you looked at it that way, you know, if you turned your head a little bit, now you might read it as 40 percent. So, point is, you know, look straight on at it, but the point, the real clue is, the fact that this valve is throttled means there's potentially an opportunity to save energy. Because what's going on here is that water is flowing through the pump, flowing through this valve. Because the valve is, pressure, is throttled, there's a pressure drop there. And <clears throat> that pressure drop represents energy. In fact, the fundamental equation for pump brake horsepower is, you know, 
flow times static divided by a unit's conversion constant and the pump efficiency. Um, <clears throat> so anything we do to lower the, the, the head, the static pressure, I said static, I thought of the fan, uh, flow times pump head divided by the unit's conversion efficiency and, and the pump efficiency, or the unit's conversion constant and the pump's efficiency, gives you the brake horsepower. So anything you do to reduce the head on the pump potentially will save energy, especially if you can reduce the head with the flow at the design at the design number. And there's a lot of ways to do that, and that's not really the topic of this. If you're curious about that, um, and go to that link to the Pacific Energy Center class materials, there's uh, actually a whole class we do on pumps, and we, we look at ways to you know improve pump efficiency. But the <clears throat> point I'm trying to make here is just by walking around the plant, looking at what's going on, you start seeing opportunities. Um, you know, to to improve things and to uh, uh, you know maybe save some energy in a retro commissioner process. So now, what I want to do now is um, I want to pop back out, and I think I'm just going to use the feature here on SketchUp that backs me out pretty far. Well, it didn't back me out the way I thought it would, but um, I want to go over and look at the chillers. <coughs> Excuse me. And you'll notice we uh, can magically fly around this plant, not bonk our heads on the pipes, which is not very true in a real plant if we were doing that. I'd probably have a bump on my head about now. So <clears throat> if we uh, back up just a little bit more and sort of start looking at these chillers, you know, at first they look like they're identical. And in fact, they are similar models they're both the same tonnage um, but if you start looking at the details you'll notice this one chiller has a sort of a big gray box with conduits out of it hooked right onto the side of the of the machine where the other chiller has a sort of a tall thin gray box sitting separate from the machine that's tied to conduits that go back to the switchgear room into the chiller and then there's another difference if you look really, really close. You know, this machine has some sort of gizmo that goes from this part to this part, and this machine doesn't. <clears throat> so if you're familiar with chillers, you probably already know what you're looking at, but I'm going to sort of show somebody who may not know as much about chillers as, as a, you know, somebody who's been around them for a while, how they might deduce something from that, because it's a useful technique out there in the field. We actually know more than we think we know sometimes. You know, for instance, so if we were to walk up to this machine a little closer and start looking at it, um, and maybe, you know, you reached out and touched it and you discovered, well, this part that's black actually is sort of soft and spongy because it's, a, it's actually Rubitex or Armaflex insulation on it. And that it's cool relative to your touch, which means it's, you know, probably you know, the, the evaporator, right? That's the part of the chiller that's making the water cold. And, you know, you may or may not realize that it's a centrifugal chiller, and if you didn't, I'm just going to tell you that. But, you know, if it's a centrifugal chiller, it probably works about the same way as a centrifugal pump, meaning that the refrigerant gets sucked into the center of an impeller and then flung out. And so if you're standing there and this part of the chiller is cold and, you know, you sort of maybe walk around to the back end of the chiller, like we're going to try to do here. Oops, there we go. I went into the wall. <laughs> so you walk around to the back end of the chiller and you kind of discover, looking at it, that you know, the thing with the conduits on it to go to the switchgear room also has a has some sort of enclosure that leads to a thing on the back of the round thing, uh, which is probably the motor, and that, and that is the motor, and, and these are the impellers. So this has to be the compressor. You might be able to logically deduce that. It's making noise, you know, it's got a motor attached to it, it's a centrifugal machine, and centrifugal machines have round impellers. So we sort of have sort of deduced now that we're looking at a centrifugal chiller that, you know, well, I told you that part, but we've deduced that this is the evaporator, that this is the compressor, and the refrigerant has to flow from the evaporator to the compressor, and so this is probably the suction elbow. You know, the refrigerant's probably being drawn out of the evaporator into the compressor, into the impeller. The fact that there's two bumps probably tells you it's a two-stage machine. There's two, two impellers in there. And then if we sort of look at it, 
from above and turn around a little bit or you walked around to the other side you could see this too but what I'm trying to show you is without getting myself inside the wall right here there's a connection that comes off that second stage of the compressor and goes into this thing <clears throat> well that's probably the hot gas coming off the compressor which would mean this is the condenser and in fact if my model was complete there'd be pipes coming off of these connections that would go to the cooling towers which I'm working on now I just don't have it, have it done yet so that means you know this is the condenser and so now we've got refrigerant coming out of the evaporator going to the compressor going to the condenser and to complete the cycle you just have to get find the way that the refrigerant gets back from the condenser to the evaporator again so you know you may um, walk around the machine some more and take a look at it and if you sort of got down on your hands and knees and looked you discover that there's a pipe that comes out of the bottom of that condenser if we go in here you can see that a little oops into the floor see if we can see that any better here I mean zoomed in too far for the to click out of the block there we go but you basically can see not perfectly but this pipe actually comes from the bottom of the condenser and goes into this black thing and then the black thing has two other pipes one pipe comes up and goes to the compressor we'll look at that in a minute from a different angle and then the other pipe comes back and does in fact go into the evaporator so somehow the refrigerant makes its way from the condenser through this line through this black thing and can get back to the evaporator which is what we were looking for a way back so now you might be thinking I wonder what what that black thing is and you have to know a little bit about refrigeration machines to sort of really be able to deduce that but if you've heard people talk and you may have heard people talk about economizers or if you took a class in thermodynamics you may remember something about if you have a multi-stage centrifugal machine if you can you know cool the fluid leaving the first stage before it enters the second stage you can actually improve the efficiency of the machine and so this is a device that does that it's called an economizer um, it's different from the economizer in an air handling system but it um, it's an economizer for a chiller and the idea is you know if you know any know a little bit about refrigeration you know it works as a you know you're working with a saturated fluid in different phases and you evaporate it at a low pressure in the evaporator in other words it flashes from a liquid to a vapor and the energy it takes to go from liquid to vapor is what's cooling the chilled water <clears throat> you then use the compressor to move that vapor to the condenser where we have condenser water coming in that's cooler than the refrigerant coming off the compressor so the process reversed it's the refrigerant gives up its energy to the condenser water it goes from a gas back to liquid and not just to flow you know back to the evaporator to repeat the cycle but since it's a saturated system the pressure in the condenser is higher than the pressure in the evaporator because there's a relationship between the pressures and temperatures that these things happen uh, these, these phase changes happen with a with a saturated fluid um, and again not the point of this discussion if you want to know more about that I actually did a string of five, five blog posts about saturated multi-phase systems that looks at water and does a little experiment with water but also relates it to refrigeration so you might want to take a look at that so point being got refrigerant as a liquid here at a higher pressure than it needs to be to enter the process in the evaporator so there has to be a way to reduce the pressure and when you reduce the pressure some of the refrigerant is going to flash off to a vapor anyway and so basically the economizer reduces the pressure in two steps and it takes some of that flash vapor and re-injects it back in between the compressor stages to improve the efficiency of the process you're going to flash it to vapor anyway so why not use it to help the process be more efficient then the remaining liquid flows from the evaporator through an orifice and then flashes down to the pressure and temperature in the evaporator and uh, the process repeats 
I think I said moves from the evaporator. It moves from the economizer to the evaporator through an orifice. So now you sort of understand how this machine works and in fact how the other machine works, but there's still these differences. In other words, you know, the reason we got into that is what would this thing be doing? You know, there's this there's this gizmo that has some sort of control valve in it that connects the suction elbow with the condenser. Well, again, if you've been around refrigeration, you've probably heard people talk about hot gas bypass, and that's exactly what this is. This is a hot gas bypass connection. And why that's there, the way the capacity on these chillers is varied is by the inlet veins. Um, in other words, I actually didn't draw the, the guts of this chiller, so we can't actually go inside it and see them. But we can see the mechanism that would actuate them. There's a there's an actuator back there, linear actuator that rotates a jack shaft that moves a lever that's moving a, a crank arm that's <clears throat> basically opening and closing what are called inlet guide vanes that basically direct the flow of the refrigerant into the impeller, the compressor. Um, the temptation is to think of those inlet guide vanes as throttling the refrigerant flow, in other words, sort of making it harder for the refrigerant to enter the impeller and therefore reducing its capacity. And that's true probably a little bit, but what they really do is they redirect the refrigerant into the impeller and they change the relative angle you know, between the flow of the refrigerant into the compeller and in, into the impeller and the flow of refrigerant through the impeller, and that shifts its performance. So that's actually how they work. They modify the performance of the impeller by changing the flow path of the refrigerant. Um, most centrifugal machines, if they're really well tuned up and properly adjusted, the inlet veins can probably unload them to 20, 25% of their rate of capacity. But then if you try to, you know, further unload them with the inlet veins, uh, a phenomenon called surge happens. And basically, what happens is the refrigerant's trying to exit the impeller faster than it can get into the eye of the impeller, so the pressure causes the refrigerant that left the impeller to reverse back through the impeller, and the machine makes a very loud and bad noise. It, it can sort of bounce around. It's not a good thing. You'll know it when it happens. So the point being, if this was, for instance, a 600-ton uh, chiller, and the load on the chiller was less than about 20 or 25 percent of 600 tons, so, you know, say 150 tons or so, the machine couldn't unload to match the, couldn't unload any further to match the load, and it would have to cycle off. In other words, it would still be producing 150 tons of capacity with the inlet veins at minimum position. If the load was like 100 tons, the water temperature would tend to drop, the operating control would see that, and it would cycle the machine off. That in and of itself isn't a big problem, but since the 100 ton load is there, the water temperature would cycle back up again, and the machine would restart, and the process would repeat. And the machine would start to short cycle, which, you know, if you start a big machine and shut it down and start it and shut it down multiple times in a row, you're going to ruin it um, because it never establishes lubrication, and it never establishes a stable refrigerant flow, and basically you'll ruin the chiller. Um, the analogy that maybe would make more sense to people is to envision going out and starting your car in the winter when it's really cold. Everybody you know, that drives probably realizes it takes a little while for the car to warm up for the oil to get flowing and, 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 and the viscosity to, you know, get to where it flows easily through the engine. And most people know that if you were to go out, start your car, run it 10 seconds, stop it, wait about two or three minutes, start it again, run it 10 seconds, stop it, you'd be doing damage to your engine. Same thing happens with a refrigeration machine. Problem is, most buildings, you know, especially if they have integrated economizers, we'll see loads that go virtually to zero. Um, you know, if you think about an integrated economizer, when the outdoor air temperature gets above the discharge temperature of the system that has the economizer, you know, the dampers will drive to 100% outside air, and then they'll stay at 100% outside air and start running the mechanical cooling to cool the outside air as needed to meet the discharge set point. So, for instance, if the discharge set point was 58, 
when it's 57 outside, the integrated economizer equipped air handling system would be on almost 100% outside air. As it got to 58, it would be on 100% outside air. As it got to 59 outside, the system, because it has an integrated economizer, would continue using outdoor air because it's going to be much more cost effective to cool the stream of outdoor air at 100% from 59 to 58 than it would be to go back into minimum outside air and recirculate the air in the building, which would most commercial buildings be in the low to mid 70s. Um, so that's how an integrated economizer works. And so, you know, if it's 59 outside, there's not much load in that cooling coil. If the system was served by this plant, the load would be well below what these chillers could turn down to, and they have the potential to short cycle. All of which gets us to back to what's this hot gas bypass thing about. You know, the hot gas bypass, basically this little gut device right here, false loads the compressor. As you get to the minimum position with the inlet vanes and machines on the verge of surging, the control system says, you know what, I got to keep this chiller running, otherwise I don't make chilled water and I'll, and I'll start short cycling. And if I short cycle, I'll ruin myself. So I'm going to start letting some hot gas from the condenser bleed into the evaporator. And basically I'm going to let enough hot gas in here so that you know, if I can turn down to say 200 tons before I surge, if the real load drops to say 150 tons, I'm going to bypass enough hot gas to add an extra 50 tons of load to the machine so the compressor is still doing 200 tons of cooling. Now, you can see right away that's not a very efficient way to operate. Um, and so you don't use hot gas. You, you basically, if you had a lot of hours where you're going to be below the minimum capacity of this machine, you'd probably actually want a chiller with lower capacity that could be much more efficient in that capacity range. But you know, if you weren't spending a lot of hours there, or you couldn't have, you couldn't afford the smaller machine in your project budget, at least the hot gas bypass would protect this machine from short circuiting, and would allow you to keep making chilled water, um, if because the loads might need it. So that's what hot gas bypass is about. And so you know, backing up, and to some extent, what I really want you to see from this is because it's a clue. One of these machines has hot gas bypass. This one. The other machine doesn't. You know, this one doesn't have it if you look around at it. This machine also has this big gray box, which if you studied it a little bit, you'd realize was a variable speed drive. This machine doesn't have a variable speed drive, it just has an across the line starter. So what that tells you is this machine, the one that just sort of highlighted in red, this machine is designed to handle you know low load conditions. This machine isn't. You know the combination of the variable speed drive on this machine and the hot gas bypass would let this machine back off and follow you know the load right down to minimum and then come back up again and load, go to full load. This machine, once you try, once the load dropped below what the inlet vanes could throttle it to, again, if it was a 600-ton machine, say 200 tons, it would tend to surge. So you don't know this for sure, but if you were walking around looking at this plant and saw these things, you would conclude, oh, I bet the designer intended for this machine to carry the load under low load conditions and, you know, again, just say it was a 600 ton machine. Well, the idea probably was below 600 tons, this machine runs. And, you know, as it unloads, eventually it starts using hot gas bypass, slowing its stuff down with a variable speed drive, but it can follow the load, you know, right down to minimum. Once you get above 600 tons and you need more capacity, the idea would be to bring this machine on and let this machine back off again. So it picked up the load swings while this machine just ran at full load. So the design intent is, you know, this is the lead machine, and then this is the machine that comes on once you get above, once you need more capacity than this machine can provide. In other words, bring this machine on once the load on the systems above this chiller's capacity 
this machine then is arranged so that it runs at full load while this machine is allowed to see the load variations because it can handle it. It won't be very efficient sometimes, but it can handle it. So by looking at the plant, hopefully what you've seen from this little tour is that by you know just sort of studying the plant, studying the equipment, you can start to understand how the equipment's supposed to work and maybe what the designer had in mind uh, when they made this plant. So this is now to the point where I you know sort of turn you loose to do the exercise. In other words, um, if you you know close this video and go back to the blog post, you'll see some links to uh, screenshots of the plant from a bunch of different angles. In fact, I'll just uh, I'll just jump to that. I'm gonna um, minimize that and go back to the PowerPoint. You'll see you know screenshots that you can download just as there'll be you know, PDF files that look at the plant from all sorts of angles. And the idea is to let you see the plant from a number of different angles so you could trace the piping out and then go ahead and develop a little system diagram of how that plant's piped uh, in, in a schematic sense using the system diagram rules that I talk about in all the other blog posts on that topic. And then once you get that system diagram done, go to the answer blog post associated with this and there'll be a video clip there where I walk you through and show you how I drew the system diagram of that plant. Um, sort of the steps in the process. So you, there, you know, there's a couple right answers. You know, if, you, if you've read the system diagram post, you know that this isn't a one-size-fits-all thing. Um, and I'll show you. There's a couple variations on the theme that are right, but there's also a variation on the theme that isn't right. Um, and it's a subtle difference in how it's piped, and if it was piped one way but designed the other way, the plant, you know, wouldn't be able to achieve its design intent. So we'll talk all about that, we'll, and in doing that, we'll talk about how variable flow primary secondary plants work too. Um, and I'll also, at that point, link you up with some other resources on that topic if if you really are interested. So um, thanks for uh, hanging out on the blog with me. Um, hopefully, this is useful to you and. Uh, Good luck with your with your exercise, and uh, once you get done, come on back and take a look at the answers. Thanks.